So I'll talk about, uh, I have some disclosures. I'm a consultant for Brain Lab, and we have some fellowship funding, so I want to put that in here. So, uh, you know, I, my, my special interest is minimal invasive surgery, and, and that came really uh, through my fellowship, and then my cl clinical practice kind of evolved in that along those pathways. And navigation was always something that I was very interested in. So I, I made a very conscious decision early on in my career, and Ilya, who was a resident with us, remembers those days. You know, I made a decision to try to use navigation as much as possible, and there was a very, you know, initially a very painful learning curve involved. Part of it was because of the technical, you know, the equipment wasn't that good. But I think we've really gotten out to a point where navigation is really uh, second nature to to me certainly, but also to a lot of the residents that work with me. And uh, because of the advances in in technology, but also our experience now that has so much improved over the years. Navigation has really become a keystone to what I do in my clinical practice. I mentioned I do a lot of uh, MIS surgery. Part of this is access, so you need access to the spine. Navigation can help you with that. You know, we do a lot of the surgeries through tubular retractors. Microsurgery, you know, using the microscope or the endoscope. Uh, those are all important components for MIS surgery. And then obviously we work, we work with implantation companies who make special instruments and tools to allow us to uh, put those uh, uh, implants into the spine in a less invasive uh, way. And then finally, navigation. And navigation could be anything from fluoroscopy to 2, 2D navigation, 3D navigation, and, um, and um, uh, no lasers, uh, at least in my practice so far. Uh, but maybe I'll move you know, to the West Coast and I'll just start using lasers too. <laughs> So navigation could be anything from freehand, and, and Pat mentioned in the beginning, there's some surgeons who, do, who don't need navigation. They're so good, and th th those are those 10% of surgeons. Uh, however, the, the majority of us will benefit from some type of image guidance and navigation. And, um, and, and there are really good and robust data now that uh, using 2D or 3D navigation will make you a more accurate surgeon. Um, and I'll, I won't talk about a lot about robotic surgery, but I, what I want to focus on is really the use of intraoperative uh, CT navigation, which is the latest generation of 3D navigation that we have available. There are different companies who make these devices. Uh, I will focus on a system that integrates uh, navigation with an intraoperative, a true intraoperative CT scanner, which is a seamless way of really integrating those uh, technologies together. And uh, I want to introduce to you the concept, and I'll, that's obviously what I consider one of the pros of navigation, but I'll talk, as we kind of move through this, I'll talk about the disadvantages and the cons as well. Uh, but I want to introduce to you the concept of total navigation. And what, what I mean by that is that I've noticed over the last 10, 15 years in my practice that I've essentially replaced fluoroscopy in 75% of my cases with navigation, especially now with this late, latest generation uh, navigation technology. So I use navigation for the skin incision, uh, for scoop planning, uh, for placement of the retractor, uh, for the decompression part under the microscope. I use navigation like some of the neurosurgeons here will use it uh, when they operate on a brain tumor under the microscope for, for really every part of the operation. And then finally, you measure your rod, you get a final CT, and, um, and, 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 and so forth. Uh, we wrote this up recently uh, we, and uh, uh, published it, uh, our experience in T-lift surgery. And I want to take you through a case and kind of explain uh, uh, during this surgery how we integrate navigation and what are the important steps, in my opinion, and what are the, the, the challenges that we face. Now, this is a patient who presented with uh, essentially three-level uh, three disease. And um, uh, he had, uh, you know, uh, radicular pain, mechanical low back pain, and neurogenic claudication. And I'm not going to go too much through the clinical features, but he essentially had uh, moderate stenosis at L3-4, uh, severe stenosis with spondylolisthesis and some movement on flexion extension films at L4-5, and he had severe left-sided foraminal stenosis at L5-S1, so I thought he would benefit from an operation, and we decided to treat this with MIS surgery. These are the axial cuts through the respective uh, levels. He had severe foraminal narrowing at L5-S1, and we decided to treat this with a tailored MIS approach. Uh, so we decided to do a decompression at, L3, at all three levels. We did a tubular decompression. And at L4-5, we did an MIS T-lift from the left side. And at L5-S1, we did a contralateral approach for left-sided L5-S1 for aminotomy. We did all that with tubular retractors and with navigation. And uh, uh, that's the setup that we use in the operating room. So the patient is uh, intubated and uh, prepped for anesthesia in, in supine position and then placed in, into prone position. 
uh, and um, uh, while we're getting the scan, everybody leaves the room. So by definition, there's no uh, radiation exposure to the staff or, or to the surgeon. Uh, the downside is obviously with these systems is exposure to the patient, and that, that's something we kind of have to look into further. Um, I, I find it very important and very helpful to tape the patient or secure the patient to the table. Uh, a lot of cases I do a lumbar, so I will go through great length to make sure, especially in obese patients, that all the soft tissue is somewhat stabilized with tape. You have to be careful with pressures. Uh, ulcers and so forth, uh, but this really increases the accuracy, at least in my opinion. So you tape down, you prep your surgical field, and then I'll put the uh, reference array for the navigation into the iliac crest for all cases up to T12. Uh, above T12, I use, this, I use the spinous process, and then obviously in the cervical spine, I, I use the Mayfield head holder or spinous process in the cervical spine. So we get the scan, everybody leaves the room, and then we start navigating. From then on, I don't need any fluoroscopy. So we start uh, navigating the skin incision with uh, the pointer, and you determine the skin incision based on uh, the optimal trajectory for your pedicle screw. Uh, so you make the skin incision, then uh, I use a navigated guide tube. I was always interested in trying to get rid of K-wires. So we looked into this, it's a very simple instrument, uh, and it was a custom-made instrument, now it's part of the tray uh, for certain systems. Uh, it's, it's essentially a navigated guide tube that allows you to navigate one instrument, and you can drill a hole, you tap, and you put a screw, and, and there are systems for uh, screws without screw heads and, and, and uh, uh, screws with screw head together, you can put it through that navigated guide tube. So it essentially eliminates the need for K-wires and you only navigate get, navigating one instrument. You don't navigate three or four or five instruments. So you point, you drill, you tap, you, you put the screw in and you don't need K-wires for this uh, technology. We wrote this up and unfortunately there's no intellectual property associated with this. We checked into that, but it's, it's, it's certainly a very helpful and nice tool. And, uh, and then we, um, uh, you know, we, we, we point, we drill a hole. We drill a hole that's 35 millimeters deep uh, because 35 millimeters is always safe in the lumbar spine. We don't need fluoroscopy to check the, uh, or, or we, don't, we don't need to navigate the actual drill bit because it's only 35 millimeters, which is deep enough to get your screw in. And then we tap, again, 35 millimeters. And then, uh, and then we put the screw in, we stimulate, I stimulate all the screws. And then uh, we harvest bone from the iliac crest. So why not use navigation since you're there anyway? So you find a good point with your navigation pointer in the iliac crest. You harvest the bone. And uh, then we harvest our bone that we use for the cage and for the interbody fusion. And then I place the tubular retractor. And again, why not use navigation to place a tubular retractor? So that's what we're doing here. Uh, so uh, using a 21 uh, millimeter tubular retractor for an MIST lift with navigation, placed with navigation. In this particular case now, remember we're doing a three level decompression from both sides, uh, depending on the pathology. Uh, so from the, right, from, the, from the right side, we're doing the left side at L5 as one foramenotomy where we're going over the top to the contralateral foramen. So the incision and the tubular retractor is placed with navigation on the right side. From the left side, we're doing the T-lift and the laminectomy at L3 or 4th with a retractor. Again, all placed with navigation. And then if you have two microscopes available, which uh, sometimes happens, we actually bring in you know, the assistant, myself. We operate simultaneously from both sides, which cuts down on the operative time. Uh, we wrote this up, the uh, uh, decompression uh, technique. We wrote that up recently for operative neurosurgery. So the 10 steps, how to do an MIS laminectomy or an MIS contralateral foraminotomy uh, or uh, synovial cysts with tubular retractors. And uh, so we combine essentially the navigation with our MIS uh, technology. And then if we have two microscopes available, which doesn't happen all the time, but if we have it, then uh, it actually really uh, works very nicely and it cuts down on the OR time. Plus it really helps you to train your fellow or to, to your resident who kind of you know, does things a little bit more independently. And then we use navigation under the microscope as you would use during a brain case. So it really becomes, initially I used it only for implants, but then as, as we started like, thinking about it more, we started using it for every part of the operation. So it becomes you know, second nature. So you check your decompression uh, under the microscope. And uh, we wrote this up for AO, uh, for one of the AO courses, the MIST lift steps. 
And then you start uh, using it to identify your inferior articulating process, the superior articulating process under the microscope, uh, your cuts, the pedicle. You know, you want to find the L5 pedicle so you know where you, where you cut the superior articulating process of L5. So under, with, through a small tubular retractor, it may be tricky to see that, but with navigation, it really helps you to find the pedicle and then make that precise cut. Um, and uh, then we do the discectomy. And, uh, and then it's helpful to navigate the pointer to have the trajectory for the cage when you put the cage in because you want to place the cage anteriorly and then I use a straight cage. I don't, I don't, I don't use a banana cage. So you want to put that into the midline anteriorly so the navigation helps you with that. Uh, the CT is actually a 5-1 case, obviously, so that's from a different uh, case. But, uh, uh, and then we do the contralateral decompression by, by uh, angling the tubular retractor towards the contralateral side. And again, the navigation really helps you to determine once you're in the contralateral foramen, the lateral recess. Um, you don't probably absolutely need it because if you're a good surgeon, you kind of know where you are. But I find this, especially in cases with high-grade spondylolisthesis or higher-grade spondy cases, it can be very helpful to, uh, to, to orient yourself in, in the anatomy. So that's contralateral. That's with the pointer under the microscope. And then it helps you find the disc space. Now, one of the most critical parts is obviously you want to put the cage into the disc space and not into the bone. And that can be a challenge in these cases. And again, navigation can help you really get into the disc space and, and find the right anatomy. Then we simulate the cage, put the cage in. Uh, and then the nice thing is you can, at the end of your case, you get a CT scan. And you can actually determine the amount of indirect decompression that you got. So you have the foraminal height here, was, which was 9 millimeters before and 13 millimeters uh, at the end. So you got a nice indirect decompression of the contralateral foramen that you can't really see necessarily with a unilateral T-lift procedure. Uh, we, we measure uh, the, uh, the, long, uh, the red long, uh, rod length at the end, and then uh, put in uh, everything. And then if we do a two-level two MIS T-lift again, we'll bring, bring in two microscopes, and then we'll do it simultaneously from both sides. Uh, it's just one of those things that over time, I think, really will allow you to kind of tailor your surgery and do things more efficiently and, uh, and, and save some time. I had a, uh, the, the fellow who wrote up the paper on total navigation, uh, he went back to China. He called me up and he said, oh, Dr. Hartle, navigation doesn't work. So um, <laughs> and then he showed me this x-ray. He did an MIST lift at home. And he used, uh, and he says this, he made that blanket statement, navigation doesn't work. And we, we went through the step-by-step -step procedure that he did. And he put in the upper screws first, and then he put that misplaced screw as a third screw, and then the last screw was actually accurate again. So something was obviously, uh, he didn't, something he did, didn't do right. So it turns out he just used the pointer through the percutaneous incision, kind of put his finger there, and then brought the drill in to drill the hole without navigation. Uh, you know, people will make these mistakes. He was obviously off at that one, one, one screw level, but they will tell you that navigation does work, and that, 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 that's, that, that's what's going to resonate with people. So everybody's going to think, oh, navigation doesn't work. Meanwhile, he clearly made a, a significant error in, in, in how he did the operation. So, um, so anyway, that was interesting. Um, the challenges are lateral transverse surgery, for example. I, I do a lot of X-lift surgery. And I, I use fluoroscopy for the X-lift for the cage because you, you just have to update your navigation. You would have to update it like with every cage and with every uh, uh, decompression that you do or any, any. So it, it's just not feasible. I think that 2D navigation, and I don't think anybody has published that, but I think using 2D navigation may actually be an advantage for X-lift surgery. And I would love to look into this further. Um, the nice thing about using the intraoperative CT scanner, though, is once you've done your X-lift surgery, you can actually confirm the indirect decompression intraoperatively. And I think that that's an interesting aspect of, of that technology. And one of my fellows uh, wrote this up where he actually looked at, uh, he looked at volumetric measurements of the foramen and, uh, and, and the central stenosis. And, and, he, and, and with the new intraoperative CT scanner, the, the quality is good enough that you can actually measure central stenosis. And he found that there is a, a significant increase, about 20% in central canal stenosis with an uh, lateral, uh, with an ELIF or XLIF uh, cage placement. And I think that's something that's interesting with that new technology that you can actually use it, uh, at least to kind of document your, your indirect decompression. And then the lateral screws will put in with navigation again. So we use the XLIF for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, 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 for the cage and then the uh, navigation for the lateral screws. 
And this is uh, for Pat Johnson. There's a far lateral disc that we did uh, recently. I use it a lot for far lateral. No, he's gone. No, there he is, yeah. So I think I, it actually, it is helpful. And you can merge the preoperative MRI scan with the intraoperative CT scan. I, I don't think it's essential, but it's one of those things, if you, if you have it available, it's, it's a nice technology that helps you. And then we use it for thoracic disc herniations, just for localization or for thoracic tumors, where you used to spend half an hour just getting x-rays in the OR, and you're still not sure if you're at the right level. If you get an intraoperative CT scan and you merge it with the preoperative MRI scan, you know that you're 100% at the right level. I use it for cervical foraminotomies at C6, C7, where the shoulders end the way. So I get a preoperative MRI scan, merge it with the intraoperative CT scanner. So, um, so I think if used correctly and efficiently, obviously it increases your implant accuracy and it en enables the concept of total navigation, which really means that you get rid of fluoroscopy, use navigation is good enough that you can use it for every step of the operation. It eliminates wrong level surgery which I think is a huge deal that we don't really talk about enough because if we can convince the hospitals that this is a tool to eliminate wrong level surgery, it's gonna be a no brainer. It's gonna be uh, really big, speaking like Trump. Uh, and then, um, <laughs> and then uh, basically the pros and cons, uh, again, you know, I think uh, the pros are the total navigation, the accuracy, uh, the, um, uh, the preoperative planning with robotic surgery, for example, which is great and uh, the wrong level surgery, the cons are just the learning curve and the commitment involved that you as a surgeon have to bring into the operating room to teach the, the residents, teach the nurses, teach the x-ray technologists. There's a lot of uh, you know, uh, learning and, and commitment involved and people have to really accept that. I'm not sure for lateral surgery, x lift o lift surgery, how useful 3D navigation is right now. I, I know people use it, but I, you know, and then, um, and then we really need more data to support its clinical benefit. But thank you very much for your attention.